look at a subject that actually Brother Ron had asked me about, I don't know, 97 years ago maybe. He had asked me about uh, preaching on the Holy Spirit. And I have a number of lessons that are in my uh, file folder somewhere, but I've misplaced a lot of those. And so I was going through and reorganizing the other day, and I found one of them. And it's really what I would consider more of an introduction to the Holy Spirit. It's certainly not exhaustive by any means. Uh, the lesson is just simply entitled, What Does the Bible Teach About the Holy Spirit? And there are a lot of subjects of the Bible. Some of them are very simple. Some of them are very profound. And I would put the subject of the Holy Spirit in the profound column. And also from the standpoint of something that should be studied prayerfully and diligently. And one that certainly demands more attention, more study than oftentimes that we give to such. We talk about the Holy Spirit being the third person of the Godhead. I want to remind all of us that He is of the Godhead. That he is a person. The Bible describes him as a he in John 14, 26. In John 14, 17, the pronouns he and him are used. In John 16, 8, he. In John 16, 12 through 15, he and himself. It is not right to refer to the Holy Spirit as it. Because the Holy Spirit is a person. Just as we would not refer to Christ or to the Father as it. But we would refer to them in the masculine form of he him or himself or his and so the very same way we would direct our uh, pronouns in such a way to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the same as the Bible. The Bible is a product of the Holy Spirit. The, the Bible is the medium of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit influences us through the Bible. The Bible is what is used. The Bible is given life through the Spirit. But the Holy Spirit does not operate directly upon us. The Holy Spirit does not influence us outside of the Word of God. That does not mean that the Holy Spirit does not have a work, because He does. It does not mean that He is a person, because He is. It does not mean that He is a ghost, because He is not. It does not mean that He is something that is mystical or magical, because He is not. The Bible teaches us about the Holy Spirit. And first of all, let's see what the Bible says specifically about Him. Number one, the Bible teaches that the Holy, the Holy Spirit is a rational and personal being. When we think of the Holy Spirit, think about Him as being one of three. He is in the same way as God the Father, Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We call Him the first, the second, the third person of the Godhead. Holy Spirit being the third person of the Godhead. But He is still a rational being. He is a person or a personality. How do I know that? Because in Romans 8, 27, the Bible tells me that he possesses a mind. Notice, and he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. The Holy Spirit has a mind, just as we have a mind, just as the other two members of the Godhead have a mind. He has a mind. The Bible also teaches us, as we had in our reading a moment ago in 1 Corinthians, chapter 2, and I want to expand on that reading a little bit, but in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 10 and 11, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit possesses knowledge. The Father possesses knowledge. The Son possesses knowledge. The Holy Spirit possesses knowledge also. In 1 Corinthians 2, backing up to verse 9, but it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Does that mean that we do not know what is on the mind of God? What is on the mind of Christ? Paul said, let his mind be in you, which was also of Christ Jesus. As we read in Philippians 2, 5, if we're supposed to possess the mind of Christ, we need to know the mind of Christ. If we're supposed to possess a mind like God, we're supposed to know His mind. The Holy Spirit, we need to know His mind. And guess what? The Holy Spirit reveals that to us. Continuing our reading in 1 Corinthians 2, again in verse 12, now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. How do we know the mind of God? Verse 13 says, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual with very spiritual things with spiritual or spiritual words. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself. 
himself is judged with no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that we may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ? Now, the Holy Spirit reveals the mind of God to us. The Holy Spirit reveals the mind of Christ to us. The Holy Spirit reveals his mind to us. How? In the word that he has given. We cannot know the mind of God unless we read about God. We cannot know the mind of Christ unless we read about Christ. We cannot know the mind of the Spirit unless we are reading about the Spirit. And the Bible is the medium, is the word that God has given us, whereby the Holy Spirit reveals those things to us. There's something else that we know about the Spirit. We know that the Spirit also has the capacity for love. Well, we know God has the capacity for God, for love, for God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. John 3, 16 or Romans 5, 8. But God commended his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And we know Jesus loved us. He's the one that gave his life for us. Even for his friends as well as his enemies. But in Romans 15, 13. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake. And for the love of the Spirit. That you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. And so notice that even there is the capacity of love for the Spirit as well. Something else the Bible tells us about the Holy Spirit. He exercises His will. In 1 Corinthians 12, 11, But all these worketh that one and the selfsame Spirit, dividing to every man severally as He will. Now there in the first century, there was the ability that by the laying on of the apostles' hands, that the gifts of the Spirit could be given to others, to other Christians. That was only the ability that was given by the apostles to other men. When the last apostle died, that ability was lost. It was gone. But we now have the Word of God. We no longer need someone to be able to perform miracles because we have the Word of God. So today you can make a judgment of whether I'm preaching the truth or not by turning to the Bible and looking at what God said and comparing to what I said. Am I teaching what God said? I do not need to perform a miracle or a sign or wonder to convince you that I am from God. You simply listen to the words that are being spoken and compare them with the words that are written and given to us. By the Holy Spirit, because He is the one that inspired the Word. But He exercises His will. Notice also, as we read a moment ago in 1 Corinthians 2 13, the Holy Spirit speaks. Do you know God speaks to you? Do you know that Christ speaks to you? Not directly. Does God speak to you directly? Does Christ speak to you directly? Well, I know some people claim that, that they do. But do they really? How would I affirm that? How would I be able to know that? Well, the Bible tells us that we do not receive a direct communication from God or from Christ or from the Holy Spirit. We receive that communication through a medium, through the Word. And the Word is what God, uh, what the Holy Spirit has supplied for us. So in 1 Corinthians 2.13, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. How do we get the words from the Holy Ghost or from the Holy Spirit? From the Word of God. No other way. There is no other way. I can be gardening. I can be potting some flowers. I can be out here toiling in the ground somewhere. I can be out in my garden weeding. The Holy Spirit is not going to speak to me and give me any words. Those words have to come from the Bible. When I read them, I know what they are. When I hear someone else say them to me, I know what they are. When I memorize them and I can recall them to memory, I know what they are. The Holy Spirit does not directly give me those words. I have to, I have to read it, I have to hear it through the word that the Holy Spirit has given, through the Bible. That's an important work of the Holy Spirit. That's how he speaks to us. In 1 Timothy 4, 1, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now, in Paul's day, in the first century, when the Holy Spirit was given to the apostles, and then the apostles gave various gifts to others, such as knowledge, or the gift of interpretation, or the gift to be able to translate or interpret uh, from one language to another, all of those were gifts that were given by the Holy Spirit in the first century, but they passed away in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. When the apostles passed away, no one else was able to receive those gifts. So the very last person that lived to whom the apostles had given a miraculous gift, the miraculous gift would die out. But God said that was his plan. That was his plan. Colossians 1.23, the Bible says that according to Paul, that the gospel did reach to every creature under heaven where Paul did made a minister. In other words, the Holy Spirit did his work, and he inspired men. In the first century, the various gifts were given in the first century. And Paul said, in his lifetime, the gospel had spread throughout the world. We can do the same thing today, but we need to preach the Bible. Because this is how the Holy Spirit speaks to us today. It's through his word. No 
notice in Hebrews 3, 7, wherefore, as the Holy Ghost said, today, if he will hear his voice. Well, now that's an Old Testament scripture. Today, if he will hear his voice. Something else the Holy Spirit does. The Bible says he makes intercession for the saints. Turn over to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. You know, it's interesting because the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. And there's also a sense in which Jesus intercedes for us. Jesus is, uh, we might say he is our representative. He is our attorney. He is the one that pleads our case unto the Father. We, we utter our prayers to the Father in Jesus' name. By his authority, Jesus pleads for us. It makes sense because he's a mediator between God and man in 1 Timothy 2, 5. In fact, he's a perfect mediator between God and men. And so therefore, understanding men and understanding God, Jesus is the perfect mediator to plead our case unto God. So what does the Holy Spirit do? Well, in Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 26, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know that not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. I'm going to tell you what I think the intercession of the Holy Spirit is for us. I believe the Holy Spirit presents our prayers unto God in the right way. We try our best to word and utter our prayers unto God. But that does not mean that man utters his prayers always in a way that is acceptable unto God, except the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. You ever notice that the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, he garnished the heavens? The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters in Genesis 1-2. Genesis, or in Job chapter 26, he garnished the heavens. He inspired the word of God. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. The Holy Spirit revealed the words unto the, the minds of men, and they wrote the words down. He did not inspire thoughts. He inspired words. He gave us the very words. I think in the same way the Holy Spirit presents our words unto God in the way that is appropriate. I think that's how the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. Because there has to be a distinction between what Christ does and what the Holy Spirit does. They could not possibly be doing the same thing. And so Christ intercedes for us. He pleads for us. He explains our situation for us. The Holy Spirit is one who, who garnishes it, presents it in the right format for God to consider. That's my opinion about what the Holy Spirit does when He intercedes for us. That makes His different from what the Son does. We also read John 14, 26, the Holy Spirit has the ability to teach. Notice in John 14, 26, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, He shall teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Now let's make something clear. John chapters 14, 15, and 16. John 14, 15, and 16 are all words of Jesus speaking to his apostles. He spoke to his apostles. The promises made to the apostles. The fact that he says that he will guide you into all truth. That he will bring all things to your remembrance. All of those words and phrases in John 14, 26, John 15, 26, John 16, 13 are spoken to the apostles. Those are not words spoken to us. If I want words to speak to you, I do not wait for the Holy Spirit to give me the words. I have to read and study the words and write them down and cite them or recite them or speak them. They do not come directly from the Holy Spirit and then I speak to you. That is not the promise that is given in John 14. So we have to be careful sometimes that we're not interpreting what Jesus said to his apostles as though he's saying that to all of us. He did not make that promise to all of us. See, the Holy Spirit would come upon the apostles on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And you remember that Jesus told his apostles to wait or tarry in the city of Jerusalem where the Holy Spirit would come upon them with power. In Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles with power, just as Jesus has promised. The Holy Spirit will not come upon us with power. That was not a promise given to us. That was a promise given to the apostles at a specific 
specific time for a specific purpose that the Holy Spirit would fulfill. The fact that he would be with them and give them words and bring all things to their remembrance, that was a promise to the apostles. That's not a promise to a gospel preacher today. So gospel preachers have to read and study. They can't just get up and pull this out. There's no way the Holy Spirit tell me what to say. It doesn't work that way. That was not a promise given to us. That was a promise given to the apostles. Therefore, with that in mind, the Holy Spirit has the power to teach. And he teaches the apostles. He brought the words to their remembrance. Remember, the Bible wasn't written then. Today, he can bring the remembrance to us through the Word. We have to have the Word. You'll notice that before the Lord's Supper, that we had a scripture read about the Lord's Supper. The Holy Spirit giving us words, but through the reading of the word that he gave us. He did not give us the word directly to, to recite. He gave us the Bible, and we read the Bible, and therefore we have the words. That's still the work of the Holy Spirit. That's still the influence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, but he does so through the word. Bible also says the Holy Spirit has the power to forbid in Acts 16, 6. Now, when they were gone throughout Phrygia in the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. So notice here the Holy Spirit forbade the apostles from going into a certain area. Remember, the Holy Spirit interacted with those apostles. He interacted with some of the evangelists. He did not interact with the sinner to save him from his sin. He interacted with the preachers and getting them from point A to point B, from, from where they were to where the sinner was. Holy Spirit interacted with Philip in order to make sure that he came into contact with the Ethiopian in Acts chapter 8. But the Holy Spirit did not come into contact directly with the Ethiopian because it would take the preaching of Philip and his obedience to that gospel in order to be saved. I'm not going to cite all these verses, but there are other attributes that are given the Holy Spirit. And these are all given to show us that He is a personal, rational being. Besides the ones we've already stated, in John 15, 26, He testifies. In John 16, 12, and 13, He dies. In Acts 5, 3, the Bible tells us He can be lied to. Remember when Ananias and Sapphira lied? The Bible says that Peter said, He lied to us and to the Holy Spirit. He also says in Acts 7, 51, uh, according to Stephen, the Holy Spirit can be resisted. They reject the message. That's what he was accusing them of. The Jews that were about to stone him to death, their forefathers had already stoned the prophets of God to death for the same reason. They rejected the message of the Holy Spirit, the preaching of repentance. And in the same way, they rejected the preaching of Stephen. In Acts 16, 6, he leads and in Ephesians 4, 30, the Bible says he can be grieved. And in Hebrews 10, 29, he can be despised. All those give us an indication that he's a real, personal, rational being. He's the third person of the God. He's real. Second point is, the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit is a part of the eternal Godhead. In essence, he is God. He is one of the personalities of the Godhead. He is God, just as the Father is God, just as the Son is God. And so in 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 14, that we read a moment ago, he's omniscient. He knows everything, just as the Father and the Son. He, he is omnipotent in Micah 3, 8, that truly I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord, and of judgment and of might, to declare unto Jacob his transgression, and to Israel his sin. He is omnipotent, that is, he is all powerful. In Psalm 139, 7 through 10, he is omnipresent, he is everywhere. We read in Hebrews 9, 14, he is eternal. Notice, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit, offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? We also read that he is full of goodness in Nehemiah 9, 30. Yet many years didst thou prepare them and testifies against them by thy spirit in thy province, yet would they not give ear, therefore gave us out them under the hand of the people of the lands. God showing his mercy through the spirit. In Genesis 1, 1, the Hebrew word for God is plural, Elohim. Elohim. In the beginning, God, Elohim. In the beginning, the Godhead created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. There we read about the third person of the God yet, and there being a particular work designated that it was that he was doing. Notice that it designates him as part of the Godhead. We have the Father, the 
for the eternal purpose which he, God the Father, purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Psalm 19, 1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Then we have not only God the planner, but Christ the executor. Hebrews 1, 2, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Christ executed. Remember what it says? And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Well, who's the eternal word? Christ is, John 1. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. Who's that? That's Christ. But then we also read, the Holy Spirit is an organizer. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. You see, it was all unorganized. And then the Holy Spirit, He moved upon the face of the water. You go to Job 26, 13, that we noted a moment ago. By His Spirit, He had garnished the heavens. His hand had formed the crooked serpent. You know how I like to compare this? Every year we put up a Christmas tree. Some of you may put up an artificial tree and some of you may put up a real tree. But we all go through the same stages regardless, do we not? We get our tree, we put it up, and then what do we do? We garnish it. We may put lights on it, we'll put ornaments on it, we may put some kind of icicles and things on it, some kind of streamers on it, we'll put something on it, we garnish it. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, the Holy Spirit garnished it. You see those See that sun, moon, and stars in the sky? The Holy Spirit garnished the heavens. All those twinkles that we see, the Holy Spirit did that. He garnished it. Sometimes you might go to a nice restaurant. The chef will prepare a meal. You know what they like to do? They like to make it presentable. And they'll garnish your plate. It's still a steak, but they put some extra stuff on it. They may put a glaze. They may throw some green stuff on there. They garnish it. They make it presentable. Why? Because nobody wants their meal served from a trash can lid. They want to serve on the plate, and they want it garnished, and they want it to look nice. That's the Holy Spirit. He garnished the heavens and the earth. God spoke of us when he alluded to that. In Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Who's the us? That's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Genesis 3.22, behold, the man is become as one of us. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Genesis 11.7, go to let us go down and confound their speech that our language that they may be may not understand one another his speech. At the Tower of Babel, when God confounded their language, he said, Let us do that, speaking to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, number three, the Bible teaches that the scriptures are given by the inspiration of God. This is the big one, isn't it? When we talk about the work of the Holy Spirit, the product of the Holy Spirit, the word of the Bible is not the same as the Holy Spirit. It's the product of the Holy Spirit. It's something that the Holy Spirit gave to us that is of immense value to all of us, eternal value to all of us. The Holy Spirit searched the mind of God and revealed the mind of God to the minds of men. How? Through words, not through pictures. He did not even give us thoughts. And then say, well, now you interpret that thought however you want. No, he gave words. Second Samuel 23, 2, David said, his word was upon my tongue. Not his thought was in my mind, and I spoke it however I wanted to. His word was upon my tongue. Do you ever get instructions to put something together that you purchase? Sometimes I get a paper, and it has a picture, and it doesn't really... Very clear. And when I get instructions like that, I normally have to take it apart and put it back together two or three times before I get it right. Trial and error. Oh, I left something out. That chair won't sit right because <laughs> I left something out. I have to go back and put it 
instructions aren't very clear. Imagine how vague the instructions would have been if God just gave us a thought and said, put it in your own words. You know what we would have? We would have a mess that we have today with the religious world. Just putting things that they think of in their mind and applying that as though God gave it to us. Now, what the Holy Spirit did is he gave us the words. He gave us those words. In 1 Peter 1, 12, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, did they minister the things which are now recorded unto, unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Spirit sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. In 2 Peter 1, 20, 21, knowing this first, that the prophecy of the scripture is of no private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in the old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gave them the words to write down for us. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Truly furnished unto all good works. Why? Because the Holy Spirit gave us the very words. Nothing is left out. Nothing is left out because he gave us the words. Friends, that is, that word inspire means God breathe. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. To give these words life. To put them together, to organize them, and to give them life. You ever notice how our, our Bible is put together as a library? The Old Testament in the library, the New Testament in the library. You have the five books of the law in the Old Testament. And you have 12 books of history. And you have five books of poetry. And then you have the uh, books of the prophets. And you go to the New Testament, you have the biographical accounts of Jesus. You have Acts, the book of history. You have the epistles that teach us about Christian living. Then you have the book of prophecy, the book of Revelation. A library, all put together in that Bible, organized in such a way that we are able to use that and live that out in our everyday lives. The Bible teaches that Christ promised that he would send the Holy Spirit to the apostles. It's important that we understand this. The promise of the Holy Spirit was made to the apostles and not to us. In John 24, 49, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power upon high. In Acts 1, 8, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. What was the purpose? Purpose for the Holy Spirit coming to the apostles, number one, to bring things to their remembrance. You know, even Peter wrote about that in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 12 through 13. He kept saying over and over again in his letter, I bring these things to your remembrance. The Holy Spirit had to bring things to his remembrance, and now he's writing by the Holy Spirit to bring things to the remembrance of the brethren to whom he was writing, and we, as a, as a byproduct of that, we are recipients of the same words of remembrance, because we read and study his epistles today as well. You see, we have to constantly be reminded, reminded of things we forget. It also says that he will guide them into all truth in John 16, 13. I have to tell you, the Bible is a big book. The preacher only has so many sermons that he preaches a week. It is very hard. In fact, probably the toughest part of figuring out in preaching is figuring out what to preach. What to preach and what not to preach. What's more important? What needs to be said? What doesn't need to be said? And, and Christ is, has given us the word to help us sort that out, but not like the Holy Spirit did the apostles. He gave them exactly the message they needed to preach on that day to those people. Nothing was left out that they needed to do. I may believe about something that you need to hear. But for the apostles, nothing would be left out. They would be reminded, they would be guided in all truth, and he would show them things to come in John 16, 13. That's the promise of the Holy Spirit to the apostles. In John 16, 8, and when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Holy Spirit convicts us of sin through the Word. So on the day of Pentecost, when Peter and the other apostles were preaching, and they convicted their hearers of crucifying the Son of God, the Bible says that the hearers were pricked in their heart, and they said unto Peter and the other apostles, Men and brethren, what 
shall we do? Peter said, repent. He baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And they did that. They obeyed that gospel that day. That was the message they needed to hear. The Holy Spirit convicted them of sin based upon the coming together of the understanding of what Christ had done, what they had done in crucifying him, Peter and the other apostles pointing that out to them, pulling that together and letting them know, you are lost in sin. And in essence, what are you going to do about it? And they answered in turn, what do we need to do about it? And Peter then giving them the answer, guided by the Holy Spirit. We have answers today. We have questions today. We have conflict today. We have sin today. We have the message of salvation. We have directions and instructions that are given by the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. And normally in every sermon that we preach, we conclude the sermon with an invitation because we want everyone to have an opportunity to respond to the Lord's invitation in whatever way they have a need. If they are lost in their past sins, then they're much like the Jews on the day of Pentecost. They need to repent of those sins, confess unto, unto the Lord that He is the Christ, the Son of God, and they need to be baptized in water for the remission of sins. If that's where you are, then that's what needs to be done today. That's a message from the Holy Spirit through the Word that He has given to us. Well, if you're an early child of God and you wander astray, the Bible says that we come back to God by repenting of sins, confessing those sins and asking God for forgiveness and the Bible tells us that God will abundantly pardon. That's the message of the Holy Spirit given to us in John chapter, or 1 John chapter 1 verses 8 through 10. And then we simply repeat that message for all those that need that message. The Holy Spirit is a rational and personal being. He is part of the eternal Godhead. He has given us scriptures. He was sent to the apostles. But nowhere 